Hello, welcome to my talk. My name is Sui Gao, and I'm presenting a joint work with Ben, Dan, and Elizabeth. So I guess most audience of chess are already familiar with the concept of sectional analysis, unlike traditional crypt cryptanalysis. Sectional analysis takes advantage of the information leakage coming out of the cipher's execution. Depending on the specific application scenario, the attacker might be able to recover the secret key potentially within a few minutes. So in order to light up this talk a little bit, I made up this hypothetical story between an industry engineer and an academic researcher. So the industry engineer learns about the threat of such an analysis and asks, oh no, what should I do? Well, the researcher said, well, we have provided a lot of countermeasures. Um, if you are into hardware masking, we have threatful implementation. We also have domain-oriented masking. We provide various schemes, basically. But then the industry engineer might say, well, um, we are a smaller business, smaller company. Uh, we are using other people's general purpose core. We cannot make everything the hardware from scratch. Um, Besides, all of our all of our devices are already on the market, so I can update the codes by updating firmware. But there's no way I can revoke all the devices on the market right now. Okay, the researcher might say, "Well, that's trickier because that forces us to use software masking, but still doable. If you have a lot of memory resources, then perhaps you can use the lookup table based approaches." For example, if you have huge memory space, then you can perhaps store all the shared operation into one huge table. The overall masking scheme might be quite efficient, but at the cost of using a lot of um, RAM space. But on the other hand, if that's not good enough for you, you can perhaps um, trade some memory space for with your um, time execution time. So if you're recomputing some of the shared table online or live, then you can have a smaller memory footprint, but with the cost of longer execution time. But there are, we know there are a lot of applications which are quite um, memory tight. So in that case, the our industry engineer here is asking for any other sensible solutions. Well, we also have the bit slice masking. If you're using bit slice masking, then you are just constructing smaller secure gadgets like a 2-bit AND gate. Here, by 2-bit AND gate, what I really mean is a small piece of code operating on software, but providing exactly the same functionality as a hardware AND gate. Um, the only difference here is like it has some security property. Because this is a bit slice solution, then each bit will be stored in a separate register or separate as a separate variable, which means the memory cost is slightly larger. But in the end, the overall solution will be quite flexible because you are just constructing small secure gadgets. You can have whatever circuit you want with it. The other drawback of this would be it would be uh, a little bit difficult for the chaining mode. Um, this is because in a bit slice implementation, you got the best throughput if you can actualize all the bit width provided to you by a common processor. Like nowadays, it's usually 32 bit or 64 bit. If um, well, in order to fulfill the whole register or the bit width, you might need several concurrent encryption blocks. If that's not possible, then your efficiency will be um, compromised. So in the CPC encryption mode, that's one of the case, because in order to encrypt the next um, plain text, you have to know the current the results of the current encryption. In that case, you cannot really uh, fulfill the whole bit width, which will give you a lower efficiency. Well, I guess from the industry point of view, although you want something that that's good in every aspect, we all know that's too good to be true. So um, our industry engineer simply says, well, that's fair enough. I'll take it. I'll take it. Let's do it. Then we have several schemes available. You have the um, SW multiplication. You also have the multiplication in the bounded moment model. Both of them have security proofs and 
to add on, there are also in the last few years, a lot of researchers has been publishing their code on GitHub. We also have the security evaluation, oh, sorry, the performance evaluation on ARM processors. Okay, the engineer says, brilliant, I'll implement one of this. But then our researcher simply says, well, you probably need to be careful with your implementations. Judging from our previous um, experiments, we know for sure that pitfalls are quite common in masking implementations. For example, if you have some bad randomness, no matter how secure your uh, scheme is in your security model, it's going to be quite bad in practice. And also, we also know that the security model doesn't really comply with the practice all the time. For example, there is this uh, thing called order reduction theory, which suggests if you have got a de-order secure scheme, in practice, the security order might be halved. So on the code level, that means if you've got the D share schemes, which in theory can be D minus one secure, other secure, um, in practice it's seldom D minus one other secure. It's still possible to do it that way, but then do it that way means you have to um, go through the full diagnose and cure cycle, which based on my previous experience, I can guarantee you is quite devastating and time consuming task. So few researchers have really have the motivation or insensitive to actually do so. And even if you finish the whole cycle, you got your scheme to be D minus one other secure. If your D is small, it's still quite weak protection after all. Our industry engineer simply says, all right, um, that's far from my due, but I'll keep that in mind. Then a few days later, our engineer simply says, oh, professor, I've implemented my full share secure AIs. Specifically, I find this secure multiplication, which works in parallel, I actually adapt quite well in my software develop development framework. And because it's operating all the shares in parallel, it's actually quite efficient. Um, in order to do so, I have to store all the shares within one register, which will be called share slicing in this talk. Um, the first instance of hearing all of that, uh, we usually says, okay, are you sure your scheme is working properly? <coughs> well, it should be okay, I guess, the engineer said. Um, I'm using full share schemes, but I'm only claiming first order secures. So although that's quite limited after all, but um, according to the order reduction theory, that should be fine. And also the previous study also suggests this is when using this scheme in a software environment, it's not such a big deal. It's not really um, devastating if we can ignore the physical coupling effects. Okay, so if we search through our memory, all the knowledge that's actually memorized in my mind, I will probably say, okay, maybe you're right. But the talk um, is basically concentrated on, is that really right? So I think it might be difficult to actually to talk about whether the comments, the statements are completely correct or not, but it's relatively easy to evaluate the security of that specific implementation or scheme in practice as we already have the code. Then let's start with that. Um, we're gonna have an experience set up with ARM M0 and M3 cores, um, both from an XP. So our cores are working at 12 megahertz. Our uh, scope is sampling at 250 mega samples per second. All of our target code are written in farm assembly. So it works on both ARM M0 and M3. So one of the things I would like to stress here is um, in the share slicing schemes, if you're using like D shares, let's say D equals four, you know, four share schemes, only four bits of the uh, bit width is actually defined. So all the other 28 bit, if you're using 32 bit processors are completely undefined. So that's completely up to the engineers to decide what to put in there. Um, of course, the trivial way will be setting it to some constants let's say all zeros, this is a trivial way of doing it, but it's quite a waste because all those um, unused bits are not really providing any useful computation. You can have it as all random, randomized numbers, of course, um, that will create some random noise for the attacker as well. But if the randomness is coming from a random generator, that could be quite costly as well. 
And the last one I presented here is repeat. You can also repeat the um, lowest or whatever the full share is not useful and create well fulfill the whole register with that. It might sound quite absurd at first place. Why would I repeat that? But if you think about it, um, the attacker um, in a real life application, realistic application, most likely the other 22, 28 bit will be um, the concurrent encryption blocks. So if the attacker can actually get some control on the plain text feeding into your scheme, then he or she may be able to send you eight plain text with uh, that's exactly the same. So then in the end, he or she might know, although the shares might be different, but in your register, you got eight groups of four share, but all of them all coming to this coming to the same end share value that might give the attacker some benefit. So what we are testing is originally a um, farm written secure N2, but then um, in the end, well, originally we find a lot of leakage. Then I was trying to um, analyze where the leakage is coming from by comments out some of the instructions. But then I comment one by one. In the end, I almost comment out all the uh, instructions. Of course, most of this leakage will be transition-based leakage. But when I was trying to minimize the transition-based leakage, I basically comment everything else out. Then the in the end, I only leave the first um, shift instructions here. So what we can see here is only one shift instructions, the first shift instructions in the algorithm and then packed with two knobs. So there shouldn't be any um, transition-based stakeage anyway. But even in this case, we are finding some exportable leakage that can actually lead to successful attacks. Um, most specifically, we are using a two-share version where the all other 30 bits uh, are set to random. So basically, this is the worst case. In the following graphs, you, you're going to see the crack he gets in red line and all the wrong key gas in the green lines. So we can see both the first attacks, the first order attack and second order attacks succeed. While the second order attacks, because this is a two-share version, then that's basically allowed by your security proof. Um, the first order attack, although it exists, it doesn't really seem to be a, too much a big deal because um, you, you're going to see the second order attack seems to be more efficient. So we're gonna say we're gonna say um, we do have first other leakage or interactions that contradict with the model, but that doesn't really give you a security flaw or anything um, beneficial for the attacker in practice. But if we move on to the full share version, what we're gonna see is what two surprising points. The first one will be we still see some first other leakage, which is basically going against with the order reduction theory. And the other thing is the second order attacks is almost as efficient or even better than the first order attacks, which means this might actually lead to some practical um, security flaw or we say um, problem. So our industry engineers then will ask, well, how can they be? Where is it going wrong? Well, the first instincts coming to my mind is, have you ever checked your model assumptions? Well, the engineer says, I have read your assumptions, but I don't, I'm not really sure I understand it completely, but I checked the um, implementation default section, so the discussion on the implementations. So most of that are actually coming from the hardware perspective, which is not really relevant in my case because I'm doing software development development, then um, what does your assumption actually mean if I'm using software development framework? Well, um, I think all of, for most of us, the answer will be, uh, we might need to think about that. Okay, let's think about that. What does the independent assumption really means in practice? Well, it basically means each, literally means um, in theory, each share should leak independently. Each share can have its own leakage function. It doesn't matter what form it is, but there shouldn't be any interaction or crosstalk here. Originally, in the hardware masking setup, um, it was sort of guaranteed by some architecture 
requirements. For example, if you think about threat host implementation, it got its root or motivation from, well, not, not motivation, but feature motivated by um, the MPC multi-party computation. So the overall circuit can actually be divided into several parallel um, implemented, but separate sub-circuit. So each of the sub-circuit actually represents one of the computation parties um, until the next stage, they won't really communicate with each other. So in last sense, there won't be cross logical crosstalks between each of the sub-circuits. And also, the author also um, explicitly asked for this option to turn on called keep hierarchy. So the synthesizer, when synthesizing your whole circuit, won't really add any additional crosstalk between all these sub-circuits. If we think about what that sort of um, architecture level support means in software development, that basically gives you, if you're following the same level of scrutiny, then each gate in our ALU should connect with only one bit of the register. Then the problem is whether that's possible. Uh, this is one of the ARM diagram of their core. Um, of course, when ARM de is designing this core, it doesn't really have the independent assumption in their mind. But is it really possible to be true that this core can actually support our independent assumption? Well, if you look at, if you zoom in all the components within that core, you will have a lot of headache. The first one will be your shifter, because in theory, the arbitrary shifter will uh, connect each input bit to each output bit, which means each of output bits will connect to all the input bits, which is already a contradiction to the independent assumption. If you think about the other parts of the ALU, um, there are also other thing, things can contribute here. For example, like the adder, you know there's a long uh, carry chain, which basically connects with various um, bits in your register. In last sense, we can actually testing instructions along. There are quite a few, doesn't really um, comply with the independent assumption. Here I test the shifter instruction along. So um, the left, the, um, the blue line stands for the first order attack and the red line stands for the second order attack. Um, if these, the uh, first order one stands above the second order one, then we say this is not only a leakage, um, interaction leakage, but also this leakage will affect your security in practice. So we see it will affect the security in practice for the left shift on M3 and the right shift on M0. For the other two cases, um, it, the interaction leakage still exists, but it doesn't really um, necessar necessarily affect your security in practice. Okay, then our industry engineer might ask, but didn't, didn't the previous study already verify this assumption? Well, let's read past the headline. Let's see what's really happening in the technical sections of the previous paper. So that paper actually used TVLA um, on a specific instance, implementation instance. It's important to actually remember that's not about the assumption itself. In that specific instance, only two or four bit, if you're very, if you're talking about like two share or four share version, only those two or four bits are actually used. All the other bits are basically set to constants, constant zero. Um, if you are using exactly that in your implementation, you are not using all the other 30 or 20 eight bits, then that's perhaps fine. But if you're using other bits as the co-current other um, encryption blocks, then that's a completely different story. And also if you read about the following security estimation section, um, they kind of take a conservative interpretation, interpretation of it. So they have a 32 shares masking, but then um, in theory it provides you 31st order secure, but security, but then um, they accept a certain, well, they leave a quite large security margin by taking it um, estimation with only 15 order of security. So altogether it's quite fair for their purpose, but if you take their, com their comments or their statement out of the context, you're basically misleading yourself.
okay, then how about the order reduction theory? Doesn't that protect my implementation? Well, if we go back to the order reduction theory, the theory is basically talking about security reduction for uh, transition-based leakage. At that time, there aren't so many implementations were actually storing all the shares within one register. So if you read the proof, this um, theorem is basically talk about, talking about all the, the different shares storing in different registers. So at the first place, you shouldn't really apply this theorem here. It doesn't really apply to any cases with shares lessing. Um, interestingly, this, what, this point has already been addressed in the previous publication. It's already um, mentioned before, but in a completely different tune. They, all, they basically said this theorem doesn't really directly apply here. Whether it's more secure or less secure, that's a completely different story. Okay, so in, um, as a conclusion, I think our result safely to say it suggests in, independent assumptions shouldn't be taken for granted, especially for software platforms. But following on many of the previous discussion um, or previous publication, we turn to list a long list of the misinterpretations or possible um, ways of misinterpret our results. I think this is a good habit actually to avoid further confusions or miss in our community. Um, I would like to remind our readers that our result doesn't mean share slicing should be forbidden. You can actually switch for a much weaker assumptions saying, well, I have bit interactions, but the interactions are quite weak in the magnitude. I don't really have to um, care about whether this will affect my practice in my security in practice. That's a fair argument as long as your um, security evaluation are using exactly the right implementation. So you cannot use one type of implementation saying um, four bits with 20 bit, eight bit zero, and then testing, then uh, using this as an argument and evaluation, and then do the implementation and application with all the um, bits used as concurrent encryption blocks. I also said uh, it also means that the security proof doesn't really guarantee everything. It guarantees its security in that model, but out of that model, it's hard to say how far it can go. And also remembering our results as long as all the previous evaluation results are quite platform dependent. So as long as for uh, we are considering the independent assumptions on software. As I said, there are no architecture level protections. So you have to evaluate, basically you have to evaluate uh, it each time switching, if time, each time you swear you're switching from one platform to another. And also we are not claiming the shifter is the only resource or only source of interaction here, or we are not even claiming this is the right resource. This is exactly the resource of the interaction we are observing in this paper. Um, there are various components can contribute, including the adder, as I said. Also, um, statistically, there's no way to locate the exact source unless we know exactly um, the te technical designing details of the CPU, which is not likely to happen within a few years. I think, I think what is really important in this is um, what does our model assumption really means in practice. So in academia, we also we, all, we often offer schemes in a security model and we have our model assumptions. Uh, we understand that in our security model, but what does it, in an industry, what does it mean in practice? And they need the connection of our security model to practice. I'm not suggesting like who should be doing what, whether it's the industry should be taking, a, uh, taking this part as their responsibility or our researchers should, should take that as our responsibility, but we need someone to stand in the middle as an interpreter who can convert all the um, well, all the wisdom happening in our community, researcher community, to the practice, industry practice, without losing a lot of um, security guarantee. Okay, uh, that concludes my talk. Thanks a lot for listening.